Hello students, Miss Swanson here, and today we're going to learn about the periodic table. Now I love this picture here because it's a periodic table on a table, right? Right? I know. So we have three learning goals for today. The first is to identify the regions of the periodic table. The next to identify the locations of elements on the periodic table. And the third to describe the basic properties of common elements. So let's start off with the basics. Along the um, rows, we call these uh, periods, and along the columns, we call these either families or groups. So either of those terms, they're interchangeable, either one is fine. Now if you look in each of the little boxes of the elements, they have a number. It's a whole number, which means no decimals, and they're actually sequential. So one, two, three, four, and so on. And this is the atomic number. It actually represents the element. So in the little boxes, usually there's an element symbol, sometimes there's a name, and then there's the atomic number, and all three of those represent an element. So for example, if we looked at carbon, carbon has the symbol C, so we can call it carbon, we can use the symbol C, or we can use the atomic number 6, and we know all of those things represent carbon. Now if we look at the majority of the periodic table, what's colored in blue there, those are all metals. So these are pictures of different types of metals. They all have similar characteristics. They're lustrous, which means shiny, hard, malleable, which means bendy, ductile, which means you can stretch them out. They conduct electricity and heat. They're magnetic, and they're usually solid at room temperature, except for mercury, which is actually a liquid at room temperature. So these are general characteristics that most metals have. The next are the non-metals, and these are on the right side of the periodic table. There are much fewer non-metals than there are metals. And these are some examples. You can see they all look very different from each other. There are gases, there are solids, crumbly solids, more um, formed solids, different colors. So here are some of their characteristics. They're usually dull, brittle, non-malleable, non-ductile, they don't conduct, conduct heat or electricity, and they could be solid, they could be liquid, or they could be gas. And again, these are just generalities. Not every single non-metal has every single one of these characteristics. In between the metals and non-metals, we have what we call the metalloids, or sometimes they're referred to as semi-metals, and they almost look like they're along a staircase that splits the metals and non-metals. So here are some examples. You can see they all look similar to each other and they do look somewhat similar to the metals. Their properties are intermediate between what we would find for the metals and non-metals. So in terms of, for example, conducting electricity, they do but not as well in general. The next uh, section of elements that we have are the rare earth metals. These are the lanthanides and actinides. So that first column out of the group, or sorry, the first row out of the group at the bottom are the lanthanides and the ones below are the actinides. These are all metals, so they have characteristics of metals and they're really important on a lot of the electronics that we use. When we start looking at the different families now, the first one on the left over there is the alkali metals. You can see pictures here of a different alkali metals. They're all kept in special oil so that they don't react because these are very reactive metals. The next are the alkaline earth metals next door. These ones have different characteristics. Some of them are kept under oil as well. Some of them are not. So these are not as reactive as the alkaline metals, but they're still considered to be quite reactive. The halogens come at the other side. So at the right side of the periodic table, we have the halogens. You can see three common halogens there. Um, one's a solid, one's a liquid, and one's a gas. So they have slightly different characteristics from each other. But what they do have in common is that they're all very reactive. And then finally, we have the noble gases in the final column there. And these ones you've probably seen from neon signs. These use noble gases. And these are non-reactive. So in, in general, they don't like to react with anything. Now, scientists have been able to make some react with some very other reactive elements. But in general, we consider them to be unreactive. Now let's just take a look at the format of the periodic table. It seems kind of weird to have this group of elements that are placed below the periodic table. They seem like they don't fit in. Well, in reality, this is how the periodic table should look. 
Now you can see the patterns a little bit better. It actually has a nice neat pattern. It looks like a staircase going up with different groups sectioned together. The reason we pull out those rare earth metals and put them below the periodic table is simply because it's hard to fit on a piece of paper all of that information and to have it stretched out so wide. So if we take a chunk and put it below the periodic table, it fits on a piece of paper a little bit better. But in reality, this is how the periodic table is organized a little bit better. Uh, this is one of the original sketches of information about the periodic table. Here's one that has some more information that's starting to show some of the commonalities between the elements. This is another version of the periodic table. Again, it's based on finding commonalities between the different elements and grouping them together. In this case, it's in a circle. Here we have a different, this is actually one of my favorite versions of the periodic table, and it has some sections left out where elements could be placed, maybe when scientists discover new elements, it already knows the types of characteristics that those elements will have, and so there's a place left for them on this, this sort of improvised periodic table. And then the last thing I want to mention is there are some elements that have symbols that seem a little bit out of place with their names. The reason that some elements have different symbols actually comes from their original names. So for example, sodium was originally called natrium. That's where the Na comes from. Um, potassium was originally callium. That's where the K comes from. You don't need to memorize these for my class. This is just for interest sake if you'd like to know where some of those symbols came from. So let's take another look at our learning goals. You should be able to identify the regions of the periodic table. You should be able to identify the location of elements in the periodic table. And you should be able to describe the basic properties of common elements. If you can do all these things, fantastic. If not, please rewatch the video. And if you're still having trouble, come ask me in class tomorrow. All right, that's all for now. Bye-bye.